Hey, it's E.B. Moss, head of content strategy for Media Village, and I am here with, well, she is me when I grow up. She is the <laughs> chief strategic officer, global U.S. chief strategic officer, Jennifer Zimmerman of McGarry Bowen. Hi, E.B. Hey. <laughs> wow. We're going to talk what your role as a chief strategy officer means versus me doing content strategy. And this is episode 41 now. Wow. Congratulations. Thank you. That's Insider insights. Woo. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to give you a little bit of an overview of what you're going to hear today. Jennifer oversees all the planning and strategy teams in McGarry Bowen's office around the world. She joined in 2003 as the first female executive there, by the way. We're going to talk a little bit about how the agency has evolved and how she is the architect of the agency's master branding process. That sounds very important when you say it that way. <laughs> it, 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 it sounds important to me. I'm, I'm shaking already and we haven't even started. So let's get some insights. I'm E.B. Moss for Media Village, which drives the business of media, marketing, and advertising forward through content by, for, and about thought leaders in ad tech and ad agencies, the audio space, and addressability, even those who are advancing diversity. So let's get some insights. Jennifer Zimmerman, welcome again to Media Village's Insider Insights. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. Oh, I'm excited and and frankly, a little gobsmacked. So <laughs> <laughs> the, the one thing that makes me calm is that we talked a little bit before we started recording. And I know two things about you. You're an Avid crossword puzzle junkie. Yes, and an addict, I think I've been accused of being, perhaps. Yes. New York Times crossword puzzle every day. Oh. And I time myself. And you I'm time pretty, yourself. I do. I'm so no good. pressure. No pressure. Yeah. Okay. My record for a Monday is three minutes and 45 seconds. To complete a New York Times yes, crossword puzzle. Yes. But it, you know, it, the week as the week goes on, it gets harder. Saturday is Sunday is the longest, but Saturday is the hardest. But I'm I'm kind of obsessive about it. I love to do it. I find it very um, wow. Relaxing. Yeah, no, me, I get hives. <laughs> I, if I'm, if I can fill in three blanks, I'm lucky. You do get better with practice, yes. I will say. But the thing I also can relate to, or relate better to, I should say, is that your bio actually describes you as a bona fide shoe hound. <laughs> <Yeah>. Yes. <laughs> so I wore my my best today. Um, you know, uh, when I was starting out in advertising. There was a woman, Stephanie Kugelman at mm -hmm. YNR, and Steffi, as she went by, wore the most spectacular clothes, but always these killer shoes. <laughs> and my husband over the years has heard me talk about Steffi's shoes. And now <laughs> as I sort of equip myself for my day, I ready myself, he's like, you are Steffi worthy. He's like, You're the new <laughs> Steffi. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I do. I, I, it's kept my need for working, my shoe addiction as well. <laughs> yes, yes. I do, love, I, I do love them. And your husband sounds like an evolved man, which is great. Jack Myers would be proud of him. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, that leads to an interesting way to kind of kick off our podcast. As I mentioned in the intro, you were the one of the first employees of, of McGarry Bowen. It's employee but you were, number eight. Number eight, but you were also the first female executive. Is that right? Yeah, that's true. It's funny. I never quite thought of it that way, but it's absolutely true. And I think McGarry Bowen started out as um, the 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 ethos of that company, the, the 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 positioning of that company is really the gentleman rebel, mm -hmm. founded by John McGarry and Gordon Bowen. Yes, both pretty luminary advertising guys with an intent to create something new in the world. And I think as they started to assemble their their people, you know, as any group of entrepreneurs do, they were looking for quality of thought, but diversity of thought. And that, you know, so really talented points yeah. of view and talented people brought together in different ways to really challenge the status quo out there in the marketplace at the time. So I think I fit that bill, luckily <laughs> for me, because it's been, I've been there for, I just celebrated my six, sweet 16 at oh. the agency, which in the agency world is like dog years. That is. It yes. is. <laughs> wow. Congratulations. Thank you. And it's been, uh, you know, it's, it, it, that launching pad, I guess, I might have been the first female executive, but we are now an organization filled with them. Our, yeah, you're our, like 40% yeah. female leadership. And our New York CEO, our Chicago CEO, 
are women. We have a pretty robust cadre of creative leadership mm-hmm. that's female and, and spectacular. And it's really the the output of a desire for the ongoing best and brightest and, and real diversity of thought. So it, it's more of an output of, of that original strategy rather than a desire to specifically find, you know, female executives. But it's it's turned out it, we really are leading the industry in so many ways that way. And it's a point of pride for me and for the company. So that I'm sure will spark some conversation as we get into it about the need for diversity and inclusion to have a broader creative vision and a greater reflection of the world as it is. Yes, indeed. Indeed, Mm. absolutely. I think it's such an indictment of the industry and it's a real challenge Mm -hmm. for the industry, particularly on the creative side of the business uh, and particularly at the most senior ranks. And I think there are two factors that are driving it. One, client organizations are really looking at their diversity and inclusion, inclusive of their agency partners, Mm -hmm. as a real driver of that. We work very closely with Verizon and they have made it a priority for them and for their agency partners to and a metric around mm-hmm. it to really ensure that that we have a diverse talent base that reflects their customer base. And, you know, the second point is increasingly if you're trying to persuade and compel and find powerful platforms that people in the world can spark to and rise mm-hmm. up to, what that means is you need to have people that look like the people in the world. Yes. So it's both a client mandate and a, and a content one for us. So I, I feel like we've made real improvements in our business. And I feel like we're ahead of the curve, but we need to continue to lean into the curve. Well, there are many things that I think McGarry Bowen is doing that is drawing new business. One of the ones that I wanted to mention just to finish up on the diversity and inclusion Mm -hmm. track is Media Village has advancing diversity honors and Diego Scotti of Verizon was honored for him moving the needle influencing and and sparking activism around that. And you recently, I think, added Hershey's as a client and their CMO, Jill Baskin, is being honored at this year's ceremony at CES. So we have some some common ground here and we applaud you for working with and and inspiring other companies to embrace diversity. So yay. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Yes. I have goosebumps. (laughs) All right, now back to business. <laughs> well, it, it, truth be told, that is business. Yes. But I also mentioned that I do content strategy right. and you are chief strategic officer. And I had asked you to distinguish between that and what your <clears throat> female CMO does. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. I've spent the better part of my life trying to explain to my family what I do for a living. <laughs> and the best way to think about it is, you know, most CMOs are responsible for the brand in their category, in their business, as a driver of their business strategy. So they're laying out their vision and their point of view. They're really trying to use the brand as an asset Mm -hmm. to drive the business forward. My job, and they have a very vertical orientation. They go deep, they're deep in their category and their competitive set in the financials of the business, of the brand. My job as a agency CSO is to, I have a very broad context and I work across the oddest set of categories you might encounter. So I have insights about people who love Hidden Valley Ranch salad dressing. And I have people who, uh, uh, insights about people who love Hershey's chocolate. And I know a little bit about, you know, technology and internet of things through the work we do on Verizon and and with Intel. And I know the food category through the subway relationship that we have. So I'm able as a CSO to take a very broad perspective of culture, what's happening in culture and what consumers in general are thinking not as a consumer of a product or in a category, mm-hmm. but as people in the world. And we use that to bring insights and thinkings to our clients. The way I describe what we do is if you think of a creative idea as a dive, mm-hmm. strategy is the diving board. Oh, It's good setting one. sort of the trajectory of how do you get into the pool because there's uh-huh. many ways to go. And, and hopefully you don't belly flop your way. <laughs> but it really is the strategic intent that underpins the creative executions that are brought to life in a really innovative and compelling way. So this approach to thinking, I think, is what evolved into what you guys call the big organizing organizing ideas. Can you explain that? Yeah. You know, McGeary Bowen has many assets, and we do lots of different things, as most agencies do in today's market. But what we're really known for is what I describe as platform thinking. Not campaigns, Mm -hmm. but platform thinking that helps to galvanize 
a brand's point of view and enables them to work through it. So we call that the big organizing idea, big in that it actually transcends the category and organizing in that it helps a company understand how to behave through that lens. A great example of that is the new platform for American Express. Yes. The powerful backing of American Express. Yes. Backing is the new strategic platform for American Express. Their intent is to help their customers, to back their customers in innovative, proactive, and meaningful ways in life and business. Very simple strategic intent for the brand. The expre- the creative expression of that is about the new essentiality. Mm-hmm. Don't live life without it. Right. What's interesting about that is that backing as a thought can transcend communications and really help the company think about what are their policies? What are their new value propositions? How do they train their employees? How do they think about policies when it comes to family leave and things like that? How do you think comprehensively through that lens about everything you do and all the experiences that you can create for consumers? So two points about that. That then facilitates the myriad iterations that are needed across all of the other channels of of media and marketing. Once you have that platform, that backing, that through line, then you can apply it everywhere it needs to go. Uh, Absolutely. And I think it's really interesting in terms of the evolution of, um, we've been talking about big organizing ideas since the inception of McGarry Bowen. And it was always interesting. I actually think now it's mission critical. Mm -hmm. As you speak to and spend time with CMOs, the myriad of ways that brands can communicate, the number of channels that are available to them, the number of actions and brand experiences that are sort of proliferating in the world, the sheer volume of content and, Mm -hmm. and the atomization of that content has required something to galvanize, you know, a galvanizing thought that allows them to provide a uniform point of view that then can create different articulations of that. So if you know, we always say, if you know what you believe, you know how to behave. If you know you're a backing brand, yeah. then that can inform, become a prism for you to think about all of your behaviors in the marketplace through that lens. It feels like a shared brand experience without being sort of ma- matching luggage or sort of campaign executional details. Great, great vision. I yeah. love that. Yeah, it sums it up. And I will also cite a line from the newish, something like newish in 55 years for American Express, I think. Well, yeah, we, we, we yes, we were very lucky to be awarded the agency of record after um, a very long tenure yes, of business with weird. another agency. Yeah. So I, I think it does speak to the power of a of a big organizing idea, the yeah. power of a pl- of platform thinking right. to really captivate clients and help guide them into their next chapters. But one of the lines that fits within the platform that McGarry Bowen created is don't do business without it. Don't live life without it. Don't do <laughs> don't business do. without it. So it yeah. can have different lives, if you yes. will, and expressions. So that that line led me to ask you to explain what you think brands should not do business without. And it's, <laughs> it sounds like don't even think about doing it without a big organizing idea. I think that's right. I think among many things, it's understanding your true north, your due north, mm-hmm. your point of view about the world, not just your point of difference within a category. And I think, and a lot of brands, by the way, have started to galvanize around this idea of brand purpose. You hear that language um, being tossed around a lot. And there's a lot of work streams around their brand purpose. But I think we have always believed that that is at the core. We talk about it as the moral of the story. Mm. If every brand is trying to tell a narrative, what's the point? What is that point that's being underscored? And how can every dimension of that story, every part of that experience, reinforce that? Well, you're teeing me up for everything. This is awesome because I read something that you wrote in a column last year, coincidentally for the drum, and you said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cite you, every story and every brand needs an enemy. Yeah. Challenger brands understand this. Their whole proposition, for example, is based on defining an enemy, which might often be the category status quo and its shortcomings, fighting those norms. You cited an example like JetBlue's jetting versus flying. So, Jennifer, mm-hmm. no pressure. But if we're telling your story as a strategist, <laughs> <laughs> what's your perception of the enemy? My, what's my enemy? That's very interesting. Um, well, 
in the thinking that we create and what we're always telling brands is that you need, if you're going to stand up for something, mm-hmm. by definition, you have to stand against something. Mm-hmm. And I think it's funny, a lot of brands always want to define themselves in terms of what they're for. But, oh. the, but the tension that comes creatively, the tension that comes in life, the, the, the interesting part of any story as a villain, right? But the tension comes in what you're against. So I guess, what am I against? What is my enemy? Or what do you tell brands that, uh, how do you explain to brands that they need to be against something? But, or you personally? It's so fascinating. So many brands are so nice. <laughs> they're really nice. You know, they're, they're uh-huh. just, they're positive and they want to be about you know, positivity in the world and progress and mm-hmm. empowerment and and creativity and values and all really worthy things. But when you go make creative thinking, yes, you know, think of it like being a gondolier. You have to push off of something. You have to push off of something sometimes to create momentum, not just pull on to something, right? So that tension is healthy. Think of any movie you've ever seen where if there's not an enemy, right. there's not conflict, nothing happens. It's basic storytelling convention. Yes. Every story needs an enemy. And there's a reason why most actors prefer a villainous role, right? Hannibal Lecter. <laughs> <laughs> think about the, those classic movie characters. Some of the most wonderful roles are that of the enemy because it adds tension to the to the scene. So I think it's, it's interesting. Our strategy framework is really born from storytelling convention. Mm-hmm. Stolen, frankly, you know, pretty liberally. And it's around a a category plot twist, reframing the problem in an interesting way, an arch enemy, which is a thing that people stand against and are looking to eradicate in the world, and the moral of the story, which is a statement of belief. Mm. Written well, it should sound like something your your mama told you growing up. It's a truth (laughs) about the world. And I guess, you know, to answer your question, if I had to articulate my own arch enemy, I guess it would be... Pettiness and stupidity. That's what I stand against. (laughs) All right. Here's a tough one then. In the business frame, I'll try not to be stupid about this. (laughs) (laughs) Do you think data is the enemy of creativity? Uh, Interesting question. I don't think data is the enemy of creativity, but I think there's a natural tension point between um, solving problems starting with data and solving problems starting with creativity. Mm. I think, in, as I, and I've spent a lot of time contemplating this issue because so many of our clients are data-driven or data-engaged, and the world is moving to, you know, to, to, to ignore the possibilities and the power of data is to embrace that stupidity and pettiness, perhaps, <laughs> right? So it's a critically important part of everyone's job, but I think of it as in terms of the order of operation, Right. When you learn or relearn, as the case may be, as your kids are going through middle school, seventh grade math, you are reminded that the Don't order— Don't remind me. <laughs> <laughs> my, my children are grown now. I think, thankfully, I am— and, and My husband's a brain surgeon. He was better at the math and science. Okay. I was better at the, the English and the— Yeah, the, with the, the crossword yeah. puzzles, I think so. Okay. English and languages, we had it all covered. But when you think about seventh grade math and the order of operation, it matters— the order in which you do things. You know, mm-hmm. if you do subtraction before you do division and exponents, you get a different answer. Happens to be the wrong answer. If you do, <laughs> you know, it, it, the order matters. Yeah. And I think as we've been really leaning in at the senior most levels to client organizations, the question is how do you create a platform that's idea led but data driven? Yes. Right? And, and what is, how do you think about those two pieces? If you start with data first and you look for how more, much more efficiently can I find people and market and create improvements, incremental improvements, I think you get a lot of head nods in terms of... I'm nodding my I'm head. I'm nodding my head, right? Mm-hmm. Right, <laughs> You yes. get a lot of head uh-huh. nods in the process, but not a lot of heart nods, right? I think there's, it's a very rational way to approach things, and I think increasingly the way to front the marketplace is to find ways to emotionalize um, some of these issues. So I think there's a natural and healthy tension between those two things. So it sounds like the head and the heart really is is the head and the heart of McGarry Bowen. I mean, that's a a lot of your own organizing principles then. 
And that's interesting because I was, of course, studying up on some of your accounts, and we talked about Hershey and Verizon, and I had done an interview with another one of your, I guess in the last year or two acquisitions, Clorox, and I spoke with Eric Reynolds. The fabulous the Eric fabulous Reynolds. fabulous Eric right. Reynolds. <laughs> I highly recommend everybody listen to episode 22. Love him. Yeah, I, I could listen to him all yeah. day long. I could listen to him read the phone books. <laughs> <laughs> well, he said, and, and this must be why you guys work together so well. I'm quoting him from that podcast episode. He said, you've got to make an idea that connects with the head and the heart mm-hmm. that's relevant for the category and the brand, but also to that person. That takes a lot of hard work, insight, and getting that tonality right. right. So what's the process for a brand to find their, you also call it their unfair advantage? Mm-hmm. And I think you've also said that how you approach it and when you approach that discovery matters also, like the seventh grade math. Right. We do a lot of work for the Clorox organization. I, I love those guys. And they're a great example of a company that understands embraces and insists on the power of creativity Mm -hmm. and yet uses data powerfully to create value for their shareholders in the context of their business. They, they, they're an and company, not yes. an either or. But I think, as, as Eric said, you know, he understands, as most CMOs and, and, and senior leadership do from a marketing perspective, that having an idea that consumers can buy into versus just a proposition that they can buy is increasingly how you win in the marketplace. You know, there's a lot of discussion about digital disruption. Yes. I actually think there's a more nefarious disruption out there called parity disruption because increasingly all brands or product offerings are the same. Yeah. You know, they're the same. There's a lot of parity out there. There's a lot of uniformity in every category. And I think figuring out what your point of view is, what you're Mm -hmm. advocating Mm -hmm. for versus what your point of difference, which is harder than ever to find and sustain, is really important. So when I think, when he talks about the heart and the head, you know, going in through the heart and then convincing the head is Mm -hmm. how I think about it versus going in through the head and convincing the heart. Much harder to do that way. Uh Uh-huh. I think what, you know, what he's looking for are ideas that speak to the truth of the role that brand plays in consumers' lives, but bringing it to life in new ways. I always talk about true and new, right? What is true and core and powerful about the brand proposition? And then how do you find new, novel, data-inspired ways Mm -hmm. to bring it forward in, in a way that feels fresh and disruptive? You know, we were talking uh, before the the cast started. Hidden Valley Ranch is one of our Clorox businesses, HVR, you know. And the platform there is really about you either love it or you really love it, you know, based on the truth that HVR is not a flavor brand, which is what most people might think of it. It's a fan brand. It really is. There is there are, there are people who have HVR tattoos. <laughs> I swear to God, they exist out there in the world. There are people who are real evangelicals of HVR and uh-huh. ranch dressing as a flavor transformer in the world. I am among them. Oh, L- listen to that episode with Eric. You'll hear me talking about, about it. About HVR. Yep. And I think once you understand that truth, right, and, and, and you can create a platform based on that idea and that point of view in the world that, that it's okay to be, you know, exuberant about the things that we love, then you have an opportunity to bring that to life in new ways. So I think Eric is right about most things, but I think he's particularly right (laughs) about starting with an idea and then finding a way to bring that to life through the power of data. And in terms of useful ideas, head-driven ideas or heart-driven ideas, I know they're ideally both, but I, I just have to ask you about Wiener drone? <laughs> <laughs> Oscar Mayer's Wiener drone? Yes. yes you know. Well, I will tell you, the, the Oscar Mayer Wienermobile, uh-huh. which we did not create, it's been around for uh, decades, yo. is one of the most iconic assets mm-hmm. that Oscar Mayer has. And we, we've had a longstanding relationship with them and, and that brand through Kraft Heinz as their agency of record on that piece of business to help them transform. And that business has a lot of headwinds, as you can imagine, yes. given people's different 
requirements in terms of food and and profiles and the cha- the changing palette of America and the changing uh, requirements of health and nutrition in in the world today. And I think we've been on a really interesting transformation with the product. But one of the things that again stoking love and creating engagement with mm-hmm. people in the world comes through an understanding that an asset like the Wienermobile, as illogical as it may be, <laughs> is something that's really powerful. So the Wiener drone was born as we started to think through how, if, if the goal is to have more people experience the power of the Wienermobile, how do you begin to extend the fleet? And the Wiener drone was born <laughs> oh. out of a desire to create more modern ways to deliver, If the, the goal being if we, we're on a mission to put a hot dog in every hand, yes. Uh, sometimes we need a little air support air, to do that. Air, yeah, okay. <laughs> air so cover you, to you do that. Drop them into hands, <laughs> anxious, eager, hungry hearts. Hung, hung, hungry hearts, and <laughs> everybody's uh, got hands. a hungry heart, Jennifer. <laughs> So obviously, a wiener drone is a big, fun idea, and I'm sure that that sparked a lot of loyalty. It certainly sparked a lot of buzz. It did, although there's nothing rational about it (laughs) at all. (laughs) Yes. At all. (laughs) But sometimes you need that, and that's that's the heart side. On the head side, I know that Dentsu Aegis also acquired Merkel and Mm -hmm. M1 and, and have now more strength in the data area. Right. How are you interfacing with the other agencies in the family and how do you how do your creatives at McGarry Bowen interface and sort of work symbiotically? It's a great question. Yeah, Dentsu Aegis Network our holding company acquired uh, Merkel, which is a really robust CRM and data company. And it was one of the biggest acquisitions over the course of the last two years. They were a highly contested acquisition just given the import of data in the world today and how it's driving a lot of business transformations. And they have a product called M1, Mm -hmm. which when you dig into is actually a really powerful asset. It actually is a database of individuals that are trackable, that are addressable. So when you're looking at doing data runs, it's not a proxy or an approximation of self-reported data. It's actual behavioral data from real people. Now, the way it's primarily used in the Dentsu Aegis Network today, given its association with the media buying and the CRM side, is to find people to target them from a media perspective. The really cool thing, if you unlock that and put it in the hands of people like me and mine, is that when you look at that data through the lens of creativity, it can actually spawn a whole variety of wonderful insights. And again, you know, do creative people love data? No, not in its raw form. They find it intimidating and and hard to digest. Mm -hmm. Do creative people love insights? Hell yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Because it actually allows them to start to key that their thinking off of something that's powerful and tangible and meaningful. Yes. And I think the key for us moving forward and the big opportunity for a lot of brands is to figure out how to put that data trove in the hands of creative people in a way that they can use it in service of the creation of ideas. I think the way it's been served up now is that, oh, you know, um, it, you can create executional opportunities. Yes, it's, you know, it's raining in in certain markets or over it's, when it's over a certain temperature, we're going to serve up this kind of message. It's being applied very tactically and very opportunistically in the service of greater optimization. I think the opportunity is to unleash it, right? And again, uh, let the people who know, who play in the currency of ideas wield it in a way Mm. that it becomes wieldable Mm -hmm. in the service of ideation and creativity. Amen. Amen. Wow. <laughs> Damn. <All> right. <laughs> but I but I think um, that it's hard to do because the tools that are being created are created, they're being created for a certain reason and they're they're occluded. It's 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 hard to penetrate those data sets, even within our own company, although there's a real appetite and opportunity to do so. Mm, okay. So to kind of wrap things up, we've talked about creative process, data, big ideas, organizing principles. What do you think the next area of focus will be for the agency? And then I'd like you to expound on different platforms that you're seeing where you can insert brand messaging such as voice right. and, you know. Well, clearly voice is on the rise. I think so. <laughs> I think, yeah, in terms of our own growth, I think what we see is the world moving to more brand experiences 
and what I would describe as brand utility, brand usefulness. It's really interesting when you create these platform ideas that we're, we excel at and we believe in, it gives you an opportunity to think about the behavioral aspects of those, not just the communications aspects of those. As I said earlier, yes. when you know what you believe, you know how to behave. Today, most agencies don't have that experiential or uh, brand utility assets in their portfolio. Mm -hmm. And we're really looking to expand our capabilities in those areas. How do we create more behavior-based assets? How do we look at experience and technology and utility and find ways, not, again, not just to communicate our ideas, which we do quite well, but to create experiences where people can, where it can influence the way that consumers interact. And in a world that is increasingly mobile, how do we le how do we add new utility to brands that are consistent with their platform? You know, I'll add one thing in there because Jack Myers, a founder of Media Village, is of course known for prognosticating pretty accurately right. about the media industry. And, and he sees a big shift uh, back to below the line dollars, where before the trend had been away from below the line. So do you agree with that? Because it's more of that engagement experiential that I think you were describing. Describing. You know, it's interesting. I, I've never subscribed to above the line and below the line. I think mm -hmm. it's such a, <laughs> it said someone who it, thought it draws too much of a line. line. <laughs> it draws too much of a line. And, but it's interesting. I, I had the privilege of serving on a panel in Cannes this year where Forrester shared findings of sort of an investment point of view. And their hypothesis was that the pendulum had swung too far mm. and that brands were over-investing in data and technology mm -hmm. and below-the-line assets and under-investing in creativity and sort of getting those messages out mm -hmm. in the marketplace. The way I think about it is having a, a galvanizing idea, having a big organizing idea is your, is your true north, right? Mm -hmm. If that's your platform thought. And then finding new ways to not just speak to consumers, but to meet them where they are in life mm -hmm. and to add real value there. Again, you know, through the lens of American Express, we are always thinking, how can we proactively show up? Mm -hmm. How can we innovatively show up? And how can we meaningfully show up? And I think that's a good guide for a lot of companies as they start to think about their brands. You know, don't just, it, it can't just live in a television commercial any more than, frankly, can live in a Facebook post or a tweet. We have to move out of that communications ecosystem mm -hmm. and into real life ecosystem, into the world at large. And I think I'm spending a lot of time thinking about how do you add utility to that brand point of view? How do you behave, not just communicate? And I think that's a really interesting area. I think that's where a lot of opportunity is to, to disrupt consumers and to capture their attention in a way where communications, even the best of them in many cases, is quite ignorable. Mm. You know, we're looking for ideas that cannot be ignored. Yes, I love that. And, yeah. and just to sort of re-quote that line again, as Jennifer Zimmerman of McGarry Bowen might say, the big organizing idea, don't do business without it. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yes, Thank indeed. you so much. Oh, what a pleasure. It was really wonderful to have an opportunity to chat with you today. Thank you. Thanks. I'm E.B. Moss, and you've been listening to Insider Insights for Media Village. Check us out at mediavillage.com, and I hope that you'll subscribe to Insider Insights wherever you listen to podcasts. Thank you.